Hey there! Do you struggle at getting your mix to sound as good as the artists you look up to? Do you feel like you're just stumbling around in the dark when you're designing your synth patches? Do you find yourself swimming around with an EQ hunting for that problematic frequency? Well, have I got some news for you. You can fix all of those problems by supplementing your ears with the sense that most of us are actually used to focusing on. Your eyes! Let's talk about metering, shall we? When I talk about metering, I'm referring to plugins that take incoming audio and translate it into some kind of visual reference aid. We can divide them into three broad categories, volume, spectrum, and stereo. But as you'll see, there's quite a lot of crossover between the information all three of these categories present, and with enough practice, you can even start to make inferences about what you'll find on one meter based on what you find in other metering plugins. I'll be using a combination of free and paid tools throughout this tutorial, but at the end, I'll give my recommendations for what you should use based on your budget and needs. Before we dive in, I want to address some concerns people may have about this subject. I've heard more than once the notion that you should use your ears when making music, and that visual reference tools are a crutch that people can come to rely upon. I can appreciate that perspective, but I think it's a highly pessimistic and restrictive one. First, not everyone has an optimal listening environment. Maybe they can't afford proper acoustic treatment or high quality speakers or headphones. Second, not everyone has the same hearing ability. I made the mistake growing up of not wearing proper ear protection when going out to shows, and while I wear earplugs every time I go out to an event now, I can't hear anything over 16 kilohertz, and things rapidly start to drop off around 14 kilohertz. Andrew Huang, as another example, has talked on his channel about his own struggles with hearing loss. In these circumstances, these crutches are actually providing an important assistant to help account for what our bodies literally cannot do. So yes, you should be using your ears. Yes, a metering plugin is not going to tell you the whole story. Yes, something can look correct on a metering plugin, but still be incorrect. That being said, they are invaluable tools that help utilize more than one sense to achieve a goal that a single sense could not do on its own. Having these tools at your disposal can only make you a better producer or engineer, provided you are armed with the knowledge to use them effectively, which is what this video is all about. With that out of the way, let's get down to business. The first set of tools I want to discuss are probably the most familiar to anyone who's worked with a digital audio workstation or with a physical mixing console. Volume meters come in a few different flavors, usually based around how they're measuring volume. We generally measure volume using a system called decibels, shorthanded with a lowercase d and a capitalized b, which can be further separated into a few different nonlinear scales such as dBv, decibel voltage, and dBSPL, or decibel sound pressure level. Digital audio uses dBFS, or decibel full scale, where 0 dB is our figurative ceiling. With some exceptions, no sound can go above 0 dB, and any signal that tries will have that excess information chopped off or clipped to 0 dB. Everything else exists as a negative value underneath 0, with silence usually represented as negative infinity decibels. Your DAW probably has a volume meter built into the mixer. For example, if I play any audio through Ableton Live, I can tab over to the session view and see the amplitude represented as three overlapping pairs of vertical bars, as well as a numeric readout. The numbers represent our global max peak value, the absolute loudest signal that has been played through this particular track. This is useful for seeing how close your track gets to 0 dB, or if it has gone over 0 and clipped, but also for comparing to other tracks in your project to get a picture of how their volumes relate to each other, as a track with a louder max peak will, generally speaking, be perceived as closer to us than a track with a quieter max peak. The darker the vertical bars, as well as the dashed lines that appear above these vertical bars, also refer to the peak value of the track, the dashed lines representing a more localized max peak, and and the darker bars representing the current peak value. They have a use case similar to the global max peak. Louder sounds will feel closer to us than quieter sounds, so you can visually compare the volumes of multiple tracks and more quickly spot an offending spike in volume during a dense mix down. Being able to spot those spikes can also help when deciding when and where to apply compression in your mix. Maybe you only need to compress a single backing vocal instead of the entire group of backing vocals, and seeing which one is causing that peak can save you a lot of time. The brighter of the vertical bars is a measurement of RMS, or root mean square. If you struggle with math, don't worry, I'll be simplifying this for the sake of the tutorial. If you don't struggle with math, please forgive me for the hand waving that's about to happen. RMS is basically just the average volume of all the peak volume levels over a given set of time. Let's say about three seconds for this example. Our ears tend to work in a similar way. A short, high volume sound won't actually sound as loud as a slightly quieter, but more sustained sound. For this example, I'm gonna play two sounds. One is a really quick, 
transient spike of white noise at zero dB with a decay time of about three milliseconds. After that, I'm going to play a sustained white noise sample at about minus 12 decibels. I want you to tell me which one sounds louder. By calculating this average, we get an approximation of a sound's loudness that much more closely matches what people actually hear when compared to a sound's peak value. RMS isn't the only way to measure a sound's loudness. Back in the all analog days, the standard system of measurement for loudness was VU, or volume units. VU meters were built with circuitry that was fairly slow to react to changes in volume, acting for an analog signal in a similar way to how RMS acts for a digital signal. As mixing environments moved away from analog systems to hybrid and even full digital systems, BFS took over and RMS came in to replace VUs, but some old school engineers and the software companies that cater to them still prefer the older system. Nowadays, the standard unit of measurement for loudness is aptly named loudness units or LUs, which are most commonly measured full scale, so you will often see them described as LUFS or LUFS. RMS and VUs are similar to how humans perceive loudness, but they have some inherent flaws that LUs try to accommodate for. Human hearing is, from an evolutionary perspective, built around hearing the three P's of survival survival, predators, prey, and peers. The human voice rests comfortably in the middle of our hearing range, from uh, about 100 hertz to about 10 kilohertz. But there are a few ranges that it resonates most strongly at, such as between 100 and 200 hertz, between 800 and 1000 hertz, and between two and four kilohertz. Over time, our ears have gotten better at hearing those ranges, and as a consequence, we don't hear all frequencies evenly. One way we've been able to express this is the equal loudness contour. You might have heard before about the Fletcher-Munson curve, which is a now outdated calculation for this response graph. Let's take a moment to break down this figure, the ISO 226 standard, since I know from experience how confusing it can be when you first encounter it. This is actually similar to some of the reference meters we're about to talk about in the next section of this video, where frequencies are represented from low to high in the horizontal axis, 10 hertz at the far left and 20 kilohertz at the far right, and volume on the vertical axis, with silence at the bottom and ear splittingly loud at the top. Volume is represented in this graph by dBSPL because it connects with how much air pressure is being emitted rather than how close we're getting to a digital ceiling. The red line on the bottom shows how much force a given frequency needs to exert in order for us to hear it at all. And the very top line is a human threshold for pain at that frequency. If we focus in on the very bottom line, we can see that to even be able to hear a sound at 100 hertz, you need somewhere around 30 dBSPL of volume. At one kilohertz, you barely even need a single decibel of sound pressure to perceive that sound at the same loudness as a hertz. As you increase the amount of decibels in, this graph starts to flatten out, but it never becomes a straight line. As a side note, this is one reason why we tend to like listening to music loud. 100 dB SPL is right about where the loudness is at its flattest, which is unfortunately about 30 dB louder than what most regulatory agencies here in the US would consider safe for continuous exposure. To demonstrate why VU and RMS struggle with this contour, I've prepared a short example, a drum loop and a synthesized bass line. Without the bass line, our loudness stays below minus 18 dB. RMS and never goes above zero VU. When I add in this bass line, which to me sounds fairly quiet, the dB RMS jumps up above minus 18 dB and our VU gets flung to the red, averaging between one and two VU. If I measure the same signal with a volume meter that uses LUFS, we see the average loudness stays under minus 18 LUFS, staying around minus 22, with or without the addition of these lower frequencies. That being said, in most situations, LUFS and dBRMS are close enough that you shouldn't have to worry about any metering or even non-metering plugins that use RMS. When working on my mix downs, I'm generally keeping track of the balance between my tracks by looking at the RMS values on my mixer and using that to assist my decision-making process. When mastering, however, I always use LUFS, both to account for the deficiencies of RMS and because all the major streaming platform standards evaluate loudness with LUFS.
A little while ago, I showed you this picture, the graph displaying the ISO 226 standard equal loudness contour. If you've ever opened up a digital EQ, you've probably seen something very similar looking. Most contemporary equalizers utilize a graphical representation of the frequency spectrum using something called a spectrograph. As mentioned before, the horizontal axis shows us frequency from low to high, and our vertical axis shows us volume from low to high, though in this case, dBFS rather than dBSPL. To understand this concept more clearly, we need to dive back into some more hand-wavy mathematics. Specifically, we need to talk about the Fourier transform. In 1822, a French mathematician named Jean-Baptiste Fourier published a book titled, when translated into English, The Analytical Theory of Heat, based on his attempts to improve the cannons that his buddy Napoleon Bonaparte was using, what with the whole imperialist conquest that Napoleon was into. In this book, Fourier claimed that you could describe any given complex mathematical equation, technically any function of a variable, as the sum of a series of signs. Put another way, that an infinite number of smaller, simpler objects can represent a larger, more complex object. If you're curious to learn more, I have linked to a great video by 3Blue1Brown on the subject in the description below. In sound, a single frequency is the simplest object we have, which we can represent as a sine wave oscillating at that frequency. So if we have a complex like signal, like for example the human voice, we could break that signal down into its representative sine waves using the mathematical concept that Fourier described, hence the Fourier transform. That's all a spectrum analyzer is doing, really, looking at that final output sound and crunching some numbers to show us what parts are required to get that output. Using that information, we can both alter sounds with filters and synthesize new sounds by combining filters with oscillators that generate various waveforms. After volume meters, the spectrograph is the most common visually metering tool you'll come across. Side note, not all spectrographs will show the same signal with the same slope, depending upon whether or not they account for that equal loudness contour we discussed in the last section. Rather than applying the exact slope represented in that ISO graph, it's more convenient to just apply a linear slope offset of approximately 4 dB per octave. Just something to bear in mind when adjusting your spectrograph of choice. A spectrogram, on the other hand, is less common but just as useful in some cases, even more useful. Personally, I find the spectrogram to be my primary visual aid when working with audio, so I encourage you to play around with it as much as possible. Spectrograms display the same information as spectrographs, but change around the axes a little bit. The horizontal axis now represents our new measurement of time, with now happening at the far right and time going further and further into the past as you move towards the left. The vertical axis shows our frequency spectrum with the lowest frequencies at the bottom of the graph and the highest frequencies at the top. Volume is now represented as a factor of color or brightness, with silence being the darkest and zero dB being the brightest for any given frequency. This allows you to track the changes in frequencies over time, which in my opinion is an indispensable tool for understanding more about the sounds we work with every day as musicians, sound designers, and mixing engineers. The last thing I wanna talk about is spectral or tonal balance. I think about this like the spectral equivalent to RMS for volume. Spectrographs are a little bit better at relaying this information than spectrograms, and some specialized plugins like Isotope's Tonal Balance Control exist to facilitate this measurement. Any given style of music will have a range that the frequency spectrum generally sits in, and by listening to a lot of music while monitoring through a spectrum analyzer, you can get a good picture of how much low-end, mid-range, and top-end your songs would want to have. If your track sounds good and fits within the ranges you've seen, you can actually be pretty confident that your track is in fact good. Like I mentioned in the last chapter, the simplest object in sound is a single frequency, expressed as a sine wave. But how do we know what that sine wave looks like? In the analog world, we can view electrical signals by measuring the current as it moves between positive and negative polarity using something called an oscilloscope. If we have two signals we want to correlate together, we'd use a fancier oscilloscope called a vectorscope. Digital audio signals function in the same way, oscilloscopes for a single sound source and vectorscopes for stereo sounds. You're likely already familiar with an oscilloscope readout if you've ever worked with audio files within your DAW. The waveform readout on your timeline is just a permanent rendering of what the oscilloscope would show for a live signal. Some oscilloscopes even have the ability to adjust the time range they analyze a the signal in, giving us the ability to zoom in to a single cycle of a wave or all the way out to the entire length of our track. The benefits of seeing the waveform is mostly about identifying mistakes. Things like clicks and pops, DC offset, where signals below the audible frequency spectrum are captured or created and push the rest of the waveform away from being relatively equal in terms of positive and negative polarity, and undesirable noise or clipping. When comparing multiple waveforms, we can look at how those two signals might sum together. If one wave has a positive amplitude and another wave has a negative amplitude, the combined signal is actually gonna get quieter, at least, 
it will when they are combined to a single audio signal. Let's talk about stereo image. If I have one speaker, every sound in the project combines together into what we would call a monophonic signal. However, humans generally don't have one ear. We have two, one on each side of our head. When we hear a sound, it travels through the air and depending upon where it's located in the space around us, hits one ear earlier than the other. I mentioned before that our ears are a little bit slow at detecting changes in volume, mostly because evolutionarily speaking, there was no need to be that fast at hearing changes in amplitude. Directionality, however, is supremely important. If you hear a twig breaking to your right, you're probably gonna wanna run to the left to avoid being eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or whatever. So our ears are incredibly good at detecting discrepancies between our left and right ears, even with differences as small as half a millisecond. It's the difference between those two responses that determine the location. Stereo audio, and really any non-monophonic audio signal, exploits this fact by relying on things like the difference in amplitude, frequency, or time between two speakers, whether in a sound bar, a pair of reference monitors, or the drivers inside your headphones. Though in this last case, we technically move away from stereo and into the world of binaural audio because there's no crossover between what our two ears hear like we would get from a pair of speakers projecting sound into the space in front of us. By measuring how loud the left channel is compared to the right channel, as well as measuring what the current phase of the left channel signal is compared to the right channel, we can start to get a visual representation of the stereo image, measured through a vector scope. The most common vector scope configuration I see is called a Lichtzoo pattern, though you may also see various forms of polar graphing that represent similar information. Traditionally, it is represented on a diagonal, but can also be represented vertically. Anytime you have a straight line, the signal between the left and right channel is either perfectly correlated, a mono signal, or with perfectly inverted polarity. Because we are summing these two signals together to generate our output, having something only in the left or right channel will represent some variation on the mono signal. Anything outside of these perfectly horizontal, vertical, or diagonal lines is a sign of some difference between the channels. As an example, here's a sine wave that is mono and centered in the mix. As I pan it to the left and to the right, you can see the vector scope rotate around the stereo field. If I invert the phase of one of these two stereo channels, not only does it sound really weird, it rotates the vector scope in the complete opposite direction of the mono signal. And if I take two sine waves, one in each channel, and detune them away from each other in equal amount, we can watch and hear as the sound slowly rotates in and out of phase between the two speakers. Why is this important? Well, let's say I have to take this completely out of phase sound and play it through a system with only one speaker. To emulate that, I'll sum the output signal to mono. Remember what I said before about summing audio? Just like that, we go from having a sound to complete silence. When the left channel is at plus one, the right channel is at negative one, and vice versa. For some quick maths, one minus one equals zero. If for any reason you are worried about your song being played back in a mono environment, like someone listening on a Bluetooth speaker, or at a club where the sound is summed to mono and played equally through every speaker in the venue, the mono mix will inherently sound different to the stereo one. Even outside of that, a vector scope can help you identify if there's any bias in the panning within your mix. If the scope seems to lean one way or another more often, you can risk having your listener's head start to tilt in the direction of the bias. And I don't know about you, but my neck is already 10 degrees of destroyed from staring down at my phone all day. So any chance to prevent further twisting and turning is in my opinion, a good thing. Now that you've been armed with a plethora of knowledge, let's talk about the different options at your disposal for each category. Some are built into your DAW or plugins you already have access to, while others are more dedicated tools that can offer features you may or may not need. In the free category, here's my recommendations. For volume metering, just use your DAW's mixer. It's multi-track, it's latency free, and best of all, you don't have to download anything else to use it. To measure your LUFs, I recommend the free version of the Yulian loudness meter. For spectrographs, you might have one built into your DAW. Most parametric EQs have some form of spectrograph, and some DAWs like Ableton Live even have a spectrum analyzer built in. If you don't, or if you want a spectrograph with a few more features, Span from Voxango is a great spectrograph that can work in both a summed mono and separated sum and difference, also referred to as mid and side, format. For spectrograms, I recommend Yanis Thorberg's 
signalizer plugin. It's not in active development and you'll need to do a little bit of work to get the spectrogram to show up, but it's a beautiful visualizer that also includes a vector scope and an oscilloscope. For a dedicated oscilloscope, I'd go with Melder Productions M oscilloscope. And for a dedicated vector scope, I'd recommend the free ozone imager from Isotope. If you're willing to pay a little bit of money, my overall recommendation is mini meters by direct. This isn't a plugin so much as a standalone application that you can load a plugin onto your master effects chain to send audio to, or use a virtual audio cable to route into the application and allow it to analyze all the audio that is getting sent to your speakers, regardless of source. It features every metering tool I've mentioned in this video and costs only $10 US. $10 for an application that you will hopefully use just as often, if not more often than your DAW. These days, I just leave mini meters open while I do anything on my computer. Listening to music, I can see it through mini meters, which makes referencing easier. Watching YouTube videos, I can see it through mini meters, which just kind of looks neat. Working on music, well, that's kind of obvious. Plus, mini meters is an actively developed project, and Direct is a really cool person who I think deserves all the support in the world for providing this tool at such an affordable price. There are a few boutique analyzers out there, like Isotope Insight, which you saw me using earlier, as well as the Flux Analyzer from Flux Audio. Personally, I don't think they're really worth the money. Now, don't get me wrong, they are very good programs and they include features that I think are very interesting and probably useful in a lot of scenarios. But $200 for Insight and $400 for Flux's full perpetual license just seems like a lot in comparison to the 10 bucks I spent on mini meters. That's like a video game console price versus a monthly subscription to Netflix's basic plan. If mini meters had come out before Insight, I probably wouldn't have bought Insight. Of course, there are tons of other options, both free and paid paid for all these referencing tools, as well as metering tools that didn't fit into the scope of this tutorial. If there's a metering plugin you use that I didn't mention, please leave a comment below. That's it for this video. I'd love to hear from you now. Comments, questions, criticisms, etc. If you found this information useful, I'd appreciate a like on the video. If you want to keep up with other content I'll be putting out in the future, consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell icon to get notified for future videos. Thanks so much to my Patreon supporters if you want to join them and get access to additional content such as my sample packs and tutorials that can't go on YouTube for whatever reason, you can find a link in the description below. If you want to see what else I'm doing, you can check out my Twitter or join my Discord. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day.